Let's see if I can drop everything. <laughs> all right. Wow. Look at all the people here. Um, it's good to see you guys. And thanks, Chuck, for asking. I have never hardly, I don't know if I've ever turned down an opportunity to teach the Word. Mm -hmm. uh, if I did, it was because I had to be in two places at once. Mm -hmm. That might be the only way. Um, I never get tired of talking about the Word. Um, I got a zillion verses. We probably aren't going to get to all of them, and I'm not expecting you to look them all up. I'm going to probably paraphrase some of this, and uh, but if you want to write it down and look at it later, that'd be great. But before I do that, just pray with me for a moment. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather together in your name and uh, to look into your word and, and just to hear from your spirit and, and just fellowship and relax in the rest that you have provided us uh, through this new covenant that we're going to look at. Lord, we just love you tonight. And I just pray that your, uh, your word would do what only your word can do tonight in the lives of each of these people here. And we just thank you for loving us so much in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so first of all, New Covenant. Chuck said that he'd been talking about new stuff, and he asked me about the New Covenant. I thought, all right, well, that's great. Uh, can I have a couple of years? <laughs> uh, it's a big topic. All right, so what is a covenant? Uh, all right, your Bible is broke down into two sections, right? What we call the Old Covenant or the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I like to think of it as a testament. You ever heard someone say uh, that you were in their last will and testament, right? Someone dies, uh, you go to the reading of their will, and you find out that you got a nice bass boat that was left to you, or a bowling ball, or, or whatever, whatever it is. <laughs> um, it was in their will to leave you these items. So at some point in their life, five years, 10 years, 20 years prior to this, they had written you into their will. And they said, I'm gonna leave Louie these hedge trimmers. And I was excited about these hedge trimmers. Well, but I didn't want the person to die, but it was only after the person died that I could get the hedge trimmers that was actually mine 20 years ago because they were written down in the will. Follow me? Yeah. So it's written down in the will. That means essentially it is yours. But the problem is you cannot have that until the person dies. And it's the same thing when it comes to what God has promised us in his will. A person, someone had to die first in order for us to obtain what it was that he has got for us. So uh, that's the first thing I want to show you if you do have a Bible. If you look at Hebrews chapter 9, this kind of sets the point here, I think. Hebrews 9, you know, if I was smarter, I probably would have just typed all this out. And then I wouldn't have had to flip all over either. But Hebrews 9, verse 15 through 17. I'm just going to read this. I have a New American Standard Bible, uh, in case that sounds odd to you when you... You're reading along. Hebrews 9, 15. For this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, you can also say a will, right? A will or covenant or testament. Where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead. For it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. So there had to be a death in order for us to receive what God has promised us. This is pretty important to think about because, you know, when I was a child growing up and, and going to Sunday school and stuff, I wouldn't have, I'm not saying I would have understood it, but I don't believe I ever heard any of this. You know, some... Jesus, they say he's the son of God, you know, died on the cross for me. And I'm like, well, how's that for me? He lived 2,000 years ago. How's that do anything for me? And what does that mean, right? We're, we're divided here. We're separated from, by all this time. And, of course, when it comes to God, he's outside of time. He, he's eternal. He is I am. 
This is where our faith comes into play. And we have to say, you know what? God is promising me something. I don't understand really how to obtain this, but we obtain it by faith. We read in his word that Jesus Christ bled, died, was buried, and rose again to give us new life. Now, the New Testament, the, the last will and testament of God, is we have it broke down in our Bible. We start around Matthew. If you look at your Bible, you'll probably see a piece of paper that's between the Old Testament, Malachi, and then the book of Matthew. Well, according to Hebrews, what we just read, Matthew 1 1 is not where the new covenant starts. Because the, the new covenant can only start with the death. So the covenant really, the New Testament really starts when Jesus died. Prior to that, when he was walking around and teaching and preaching and, and saving and uh, healing people and all that, he was moving toward the cross. But it was only at the cross that what he had promised us becomes ours. You, get, you see what I'm saying? Because he had to die. He came here in order to enact this covenant for us. In Luke 22, 20, Jesus held up a cup of wine and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. So he was telling them already, right, before he went to the cross, that the blood was the reason for the covenant. Jeremiah 31, he told us what the new covenant was going to be. And he said, God said that he was going to write his laws in our heart and in our minds. So he had laws written on stone, right, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. <laughs> well, the new covenant, we're no longer really dealing with these laws written on a piece of stone because in the new covenant, God's spirit moves into us and he writes his law in our heart and in our mind. That's the promise that he gave through Jeremiah. He gave the same promise in Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8 was just reiterating that same promise. And he said, they will all know me from the greatest to the least, to the least to the greatest. And he says, I will forgive their sins or iniquity and remember their sin no more. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. He not only forgives our sins and doesn't remember them anymore, he actually enables us to not remember them anymore. One of the things I see and hear a lot of people have a problem leaving things alone. They are, it's always ever present. You know, this is what this is what we call a sin consciousness. In Hebrews nine and ten, we're gonna probably we may or may not get into this tonight. I got a, like I said, I got a lot of scripture, and thankfully, <laughs> I got next week. So if you uh, if you're around next week, we'll hopefully. Maybe we'll be able to wrap some of this up. We've got some dangling pieces here tonight, probably. But and so the Bible says that Jesus' blood enables us, enables God to forgive us for our sins. But it also teaches us that his death actually kills off the sinner. Because he has joined us into this death, burial, and resurrection. Not only did Jesus Christ die that day on that cross, but according to the scriptures. We die too. So not only did we have our sins, the bad things we had done, forgiven, we act, God actually crucified the sinner. Amen. See, God's not happy. He's not satisfied with just forgiving you for the sins. He wants the sin to stop. Yeah. And the only way it stops is if the <laughs> sinner dies. Oh, so he forgives of our sins. He actually crucifies the sinner, and not only has he forgiven our sins and crucified the sinner, he actually can give us a consciousness that is sin-free. Animal sacrifices could never, ever cleanse the conscience of the worshiper. That's what it tells us in Hebrews 9 and 10. But Jesus' blood actually can cleanse your conscience. And what I mean by that is... <clears throat> Even though we read in the book, it says, you know, he forgave us for our sins. And we might even read where it says, you know, I actually died with him. And I've been raised to walk in new life. But I just can't quit thinking about all the rotten, nasty, mean things I've done. I can't quit being sin conscious. Well, I'm here to tell you that it's available for you for that to go away. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to live your life under condemnation and feeling like I'm a filthy sinner, but I'm forgiven. 
See, if the devil can't have you, he can shut you down. See, that's what he wants to do. He's like, oh man, another one's forgiven. Oh man, another new creature. He popped back up. Another new creature's popped up. Oh, I'll tell you what, if, if I can just keep him from realizing he doesn't have to walk around thinking he's a filthy, rotten worm, if I can keep him from understanding that, then I can still kind of rule his life. Mm -hmm. yeah. See, I don't walk around thinking I'm a sinner. I don't walk around thinking about sin at all. <laughs> be honest with you. Great. <laughs> because what the Bible tells us to do is to get, we get a Christ consciousness. We, we look to Christ. As we look to Him, He miraculously deals with anything that might be there in our life that shouldn't be there. Because guess what? I couldn't deal with it before I came to Christ. And guess what? I can't deal with it now. <laughs> I couldn't fix it then. I can't fix it now. I, I, I come to the place where I realize I'm powerless over sin. And guess what? I'm still powerless even with Christ in me. Because God designed man, men and women, humans, to be powerless. Because he is the power in you. You are powerless. You are created to be powerless. Not people that are addicts. They have to be powerless. No. Human beings, 100% of all human beings, have to come to this conclusion. Yeah. It's not just people in those meetings. <laughs> those people over there, they need to see that they're powerless. <laughs> no, all of us have to come to that place. And God just, he just loves to come up with different ways to get us to see it. Every one of us have to come to see it, though. Now, I would like you to look at these verses if you've got a Bible. Ezekiel, I don't know if these are some of the ones that Chuck's touched on or not, but Ezekiel... 20, let's see, Ezekiel 36. <coughs> these verses right here, I always love these verses. Because this is two verses in Ezekiel that tell us what the new covenant is going to be. Because this was prior to Christ coming, right? Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. This is, this is uh, in Ezekiel, he's, he's prophesying, I guess you could say, about what the new covenant is going to be. Ezekiel 36, 26, he says, Moreover, this is God actually speaking, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So, in Ezekiel, he's telling us he's going to take out our stony heart, he's going to give us a, a fleshy heart, he's going to put his spirit in us, and then he, by way of his spirit in us, will move us from inside of us to do what he has for us to do. That's the same thing that he's saying in Jeremiah and in Hebrews 8, where he says, I'm going to write my laws in your heart and your mind. It's the same thing, because he's doing this by his spirit. He doesn't take a a pen and carve thou shalt not have any other gods before me in your heart. He, it's not the Ten Commandments carved in your new heart. That's not what he's meaning. What he means is, I'm going to put the law of my very being in you. Yeah. The very nature of who I am is going to be in you. Wow, man. That's the new covenant. Yeah. The very divine nature of God. If you're a born-again person, if you have received Christ, then the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and that means you have God's very divine nature in you. And what our role as a new covenant believer is, is to learn how to walk in the new nature we have. And guess what? That means that we do not have a sinful nature anymore. It's gone. It's been dealt with. Yeah. We have a divine, heavenly DNA Amen. in us. Thank you, Lord. In Titus, it says that we have been regenerated. You know what regenerated means? Regened. <laughs> Regened. That's what's happened to us. We are all sinners, fallen, separated, dead in sin because of Adam. We had his genes, the fallen genes. Yeah. But that's why Jesus tells us we have to be born again. When we're born again, born from above, we have now got God's very own divine nature, His genes in Amen. us. Amen. 
That's how we're. That's how we become a Thank child of Jesus. God. Is because we're born of God. Amen. It's the new covenant. It's the new. It's the new thing. So I don't have to think about a bunch of things written on stone, pieces of stone, because it's now my nature to do them. Look at Romans eight. I'm going off script here. Look at Romans eight. Louis, you're nuts, man. Where are you getting this from? Well, believe it or not, it's in this book right here. Romans 8. I'm going to read the first four verses. Romans 8, starting in verse 1, says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life... See, there's a law of the Spirit. <coughs> the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. See, we still are operating according to law. <laughs> it's just not law written on stone. It's the law of the Spirit. <laughs> See, the Bible talks about the law sometimes. It's not talking about things written in stone necessarily. What it means is the way something works. When you drop something, I'm going to do my magic trick. How many of you think I can make this float in the air? I got one. <laughs> I paid her. Just said it. So if I if I let go of this tablet, what's going to happen? It's going to fall, isn't it? So. You, why is it going to fall? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, is it the law or is it just gravity? It's the law. See, it's not the law. The law doesn't make it fall. Gravity makes it fall. The law is what we describe. How it works. Uh -huh. See, the law of something we came up with to describe how gravity works. So the law of the spirit of life, how the spirit of life in Christ works, is in you. And in you, he moves you to do what he has for you to do. That's the law of the spirit of life in Christ. Awesome. Mm -hmm. It's setting you free from the law of sin and death. Sin brings death. Sin brings death. It's the law. So sometimes when you see the term law in the Bible, it's not talking about just the Ten Commandments. It's talking about how something works. It's defining for us how something works. So the law of God is telling us how God operates. So the Ten Commandments was never given to us because he, God thought we should perform them. Okay. They were always given to us so that we would see how God operates and that we would come to realize we can't operate like that. And we'd say, oh, Lord, I need a Savior. And he'd go, you got that right? <laughs> The law did its job because it led you to Christ. It's our schoolmaster. So in Romans 8, it says, We have been freed from one law by another law. All right, let me, I'm going to put this microphone down. Well, maybe I can do it one handed. This would be a real magic trick. All right, so if you have this tablet and I drop it, the law dictates, the law of gravity tells us it's going to hit the table, right? But if I have another law that comes in play, then maybe, just maybe, it won't hit the table. Now watch this. Whoa. How about that? The law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is still operative. Sin always will bring death. But God has provided a way to keep us from that death. He has given us a Holy Spirit parachute to keep us from splatting. <laughs> yeah. Right? A parachute. See, you jump out of a plane with a parachute. The parachute really doesn't do any good if there's no gravity. But without the parachute, gravity is going to get you. Right? Gravity still exists, but you beat gravity by the parachute because you introduce another law. Mm -hmm. And that's what God has done in Christ. He has introduced the law of the Spirit to set us free from the sin and death law. <coughs> so look at verse 3, Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, see, the law couldn't, couldn't get done in us what God wanted done in us because our flesh was unable to perform what the law says. So what the law could not do, weak as it was through our flesh, God did. God himself did it, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why would he do that? Look at verse 4. 
so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the law couldn't fix us. It was never intended to fix us. But God himself, in the form of Jesus Christ, came here, died our death. I love that verse. He says he condemned sin in the flesh. He did not condemn the flesh. Amen. It's very important to see this because he didn't condemn you for being human. See, he's, what he's doing is he's setting you free to really be fully human for the first time. Mm. That's what the cross is all about. It's about removing the problem, which was sin, mm -hmm. and rebirthing you as a fully, fully formed human for the first time ever. The real you only showed up when the Holy Spirit joined to your human spirit. Then you arrived. So when Jesus says you must be born again, it's really our first birth, our real birth. The first one, we're dead in our sins. See, what we're calling the new birth is, I got born again when I was in 2001. Until 2001, I was faking it. <laughs> because I didn't know who I was. And guess what? You were too, until you got born again. Because you had this idea in your head about who, who you are and what you're supposed to be like and how you're supposed to behave and dress and all these things. Well, that doesn't work out so well. At least it didn't for me. It got me just divorced and burying friends, lost jobs, raging addiction for 15 years, uh, crazy insanity in my mind. That's what, that's what me trying to live my life got me. When I finally got to the place where I couldn't do it anymore and I cried out, Christ moved in and Louis, the Louis you see standing here today, showed up for the first time. And you know what? I don't have to pretend anymore. I don't have to perform. I don't have to act like Louie because I just am. And you can like it or lump it. Because this is who I am, right? That's where the freedom comes in. But Christ condemned sin in the flesh. He didn't condemn the flesh. But he did it. It says that he got, we couldn't do it. The law couldn't do it. So God himself has done it. So the new covenant is really... I got to do this. He gave the law way back in the Old Testament, and the children of Israel said, Moses, you go find out what he wants, and when you come back and tell us, we'll do whatever you say. <laughs> and God's going, yeah, right. You're not going to do anything I say. That's how deceived sin makes us. We actually think we can do it. So we try. I'm going to quit lying. I'm going to quit doing drugs. I'm going to quit cheating on my wife. I'm going to quit stealing. I'm going to quit whatever. I'm going to quit fighting. I'm going to quit whatever it is. And then you quit for about 30 seconds. Oh, man, I'm do it again. Do it again. And God's going, yeah, I know that's what my law is supposed to do. My law is supposed to drive you out of your mind. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. You're supposed to try to do it and fail to do it. Try and fail, try and fail. Until it finally gets you to the place where you say, God, I can't do this. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And, God, and then all of a sudden, God goes, aha, now we're getting somewhere. Now you're starting to realize you got a problem. Amen. And then you can't perform up to my perfect, holy standard. So now you can receive the new heart and my spirit inside of you. And now I can move you to do what I have for you to do. Because I'm the only one who can keep my law. I'm the lawgiver, and I'm the only law keeper. The good news is your faith in me allows me to keep my law in you, through you, and as you. That's how it works. We become a part of his body. We become a branch attached to his vine. He produces the fruit and we get to bear it. The life of Christ gets to show up in Louis and through Louis because Christ is in me, not because I'm imitating someone or trying. Ah, oh, that's where rest comes in. Right? That's how we get to rest because we're trusting Him in me. I'm trusting Him in me. All right, I just got a few more things. It's going to be rapid fire. This is something you can look at if you want to, but I was going to get into the book of Hebrews, so we'll probably do this next time. The book of Hebrews was written to, you guessed it, the Hebrews. <laughs> I, 
Man, that's a sharp bunch right here. <laughs> <laughs> the whole letter to the Hebrews is is the author, which is a big debate discussion, who wrote it, and I don't really care to get into that, but the author is telling us all in the book of Hebrews that Christ is greater than anything that came before him. That's what that that's what it really boils down to. The first chapter or two, he's greater than the angels. Chapter three, he's greater than Moses. Chapter 4, he's greater than Joshua. And then on into 7, you see that he is a new high priest for us. And he's greater than the priesthood that came before him. There's a whole lot of details in here that I can't, I'm not going to spend the time on right now. But if you tune in next week at the same bad time and the same bad channel, you might get a little more details. Um, but I will tell you this, in chapter 7 of Hebrews, it starts. To, it shows us how the earthly priesthood in the Old Testament, the way that worked was you had to be from a certain family, right? You had to be from the tribe of Levi. If you were not of the tribe of Levi, you could not be a priest. Forget it, you're out. So guess what? Hebrews reveals to us that Jesus did not qualify to serve in the earthly tabernacle. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> the sinless Son of God would not have qualified to serve in the earthly tabernacle because he was from the wrong tribe. He's from the tribe of Judah. And there was no record of any priest coming from the tribe of Judah. That's what it tells us in Hebrews 7. But here's the thing. If there's a new priesthood, there's got to be a new law. And that's what God has done. He's got a new priest, Jesus Christ. Therefore, he has introduced a new law, a new covenant, a new way of operating. And that's what the New Covenant is all about. The priest in the Old Testament would live, they, about 30 years old, they could become a priest, and they did that till about 50, or maybe they died. But then their son, or son, the next in line, would come up behind them, and their work was never done. Sacrificing animals, sacrificing animals, over and over and over and over. But with Jesus, he offers himself once. And then he sits down. He's offering himself, his Precious eternal blood finishes what the animal blood could never finish. So just as those priests stood in for the nation of Israel over and over again, year after year after year, Jesus now stands in for us based on the power of an indestructible life. It says that he ever lives to intercede for the saints. He'll never die. And there will never be another priest coming up behind him. No new law is coming. This is it. It's established and it's in his blood. That's it. The New Testament is in Jesus Christ, sinless blood. They put animal blood in the tabernacle or the temple and the earth. But according to Hebrews 10, 9 and 10, there is heavenly, sinless, perfect human blood in a heavenly temple. Animal blood was a picture of what was to come. So here's what this means. Here's what this means. This means that God, who is perfect, demands perfection from his imagers. Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And he meant it. We can't use the uh, no one's perfect thing. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. God expects you to be perfect, but he also knows you can't. So we're in a trouble. We're in trouble. We're in a bad situation here. But according to Hebrews 10, 14, it says, By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Amen. Whoa. So God is perfect. He expects perfect from you. Now, that does not mean every bit of your behavior and every thought you have is maybe the way you want it. That's not what that means. What it means is whole and complete. When Christ moves into you, you're a whole and complete person. That means you're perfect. Mm -hmm. You're not lacking anything. Anything. We can't, there's no more for God to do that he hasn't done in his son. Amen. Yes. That's the new covenant. <laughs> he has left us everything in his will by way of his son Jesus Christ everything 
I, I, I need some more forgiveness. Nope, you got all you need. I need, I need to be more holy. No, no, you can't be more holy than Jesus. And if he's joining you and he's living your life, you're as holy as you need to be. Yeah. Right. I need to be more sanctified, not according to 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that he, God made him to be wisdom to us from God. Righteousness, sanctification. Christ is all we need. Yeah. <laughs> so what do we do? We spend our lives unpacking all the things that he's done for us and left for us in his will. Man, what, oh, wow, whoa, I am holy. Look at that. He left me righteousness. Oh, my gosh. The, here's the key. It's faith. We only receive and walk in this. Anything God offers us only comes to us by faith, period. Well, I don't feel righteous. I don't care. I don't look holy. I don't care. Faith says I am holy. Faith says I am righteous. Faith does not say I'm arrogant and I'm thinking that I did this. Faith says, oh my gosh, look at all of what he's done for me. Amen. That humbles you. That breaks you down. That makes you thankful. That makes your life go, wow. That's what you do all day long. Wow. I'm sober. Amen. I'm not running from anybody. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm not hiding things. All that goes away. And that's where we get the peace that passes all understanding. So he's better than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Joshua, greater than the earthly priesthood. He's brought us a better covenant based on a better sacrifice. Wow. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love looking at this. It's it's just astounding. But it all comes down to Jesus Christ shed his blood and died on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day in order to activate all of this stuff in our life. That's how it works. We didn't become righteous and holy and saved and forgiven because Jesus was born as a little baby. We didn't, get that. we didn't get those things because he walked on water. We didn't get those things because he multiplied food. We got all of that because he died. And the testament, the will is enacted because he died. The testator, the one who left the will, had to die in order to transfer the stuff, the goods, to us. And that is the new covenant in his blood. And he said, if you don't drink of me and eat of me, you have no part of me. Mm -hmm. And that means receiving him by faith. Mm -hmm. Eating and drinking is a picture of taking him in at his, at his word by faith. You take it in just like you do food and water, food and wine. You receive it. <coughs> and feed it. Wow. All right. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for... Uh, for your new testament, your new covenant, uh, the blood of Jesus. Wow, what an amazing, amazing gift, an amazing plan that you have and that we could be a part of this. And uh, Lord, I just pray for each person here in this room tonight. I don't know where they are with you, but I just pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would just continue by your spirit to uh, speak to them. And, and if they don't know you, I pray that they will never sleep again until they hash this out of you. I pray that you will not leave them alone until they come to you and that uh, they come to know who you are or they just make up their mind to reject you entirely. But Lord, I just pray that tonight, sometime, even now or, or later, however it turns out, Lord, that you will push them into a corner and that they will be forced to make a decision to receive you or reject you because that's, that's, that's what this is all about. And, uh, Lord, we just thank you for what you've done for us through Christ and uh, we just love you tonight. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.